Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Jamie Bianchini. He's the co-founder and CEO at Ludella. Jamie, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much. Good to be back. Yeah, I'm excited to have you back on the show. I was looking earlier before we recorded. It's been a couple years since you were last on the show. So I'm selfishly fascinated to see kind of your journey and, and cover all the new stuff. But for people that don't know you and, and Ludella, you have a really, really cool story of how everything came to be. So do you maybe want to walk us through a bit of your, your childhood, where you grew up, where you went to school, and then give us a really good overview of how Ludella came to be? Because the story is really quite fascinating for people that haven't heard it. Yeah, um, and I grew up in a pretty standard you know, middle class, upper middle class, like raising, went to college at USC, University gotcha. of Southern California, and studied, studied business there. Uh, and thought I could kind of conquer the world right out of college and ended gotcha. up driving myself into bankruptcy. Wow. Uh, by the time I was 28, I, I declared bankruptcy and just, just made a ton of silly mistakes when I was young. And uh, But then decided to do what I really loved in life, which was to ride my bike around the world and wow. uh, founded, a, founded a, an international cycling expedition called Peace Peddlers, where I rode a tandem bicycle the front seat and left the back seat of the ta of the tandem bike open to pick up strangers and turn strangers into friends in a project called peace peddlers okay uh epic journey ended up being eight years 81 countries how, how did you come uh, and, up with the idea though originally uh it was me and me and my me and my one of my buddies from college uh we okay. were you know coming up we we're just trying to find a way to do what we really loved and coming up with different names and concepts and ways to get sponsors to pay for our trip around the world so sure. Uh, one thing led to another. Uh, we wanted to put our heart into something, make a difference in the world, but still have a lot of fun. So we built these uh, these tandem these, this tandem bicycles that can become single mountain bikes as well. So wow. really was a dream trip because we can go out and pick up strangers out in the way and make new friends and connect with the world, but still ride mountain bikes, turning the tandems into singles. So it was quite an engineering feat to create those bikes too. And we ended up getting sponsored by Panasonic and wow. about 40 other, 40 other companies to do this big trip. And but, and and then that leads to where this whole journey comes up because about halfway through, I was in Burkina Faso, okay. uh, and, which is uh, which is in West Africa, and I was in a candle fire. I fell asleep with the candle burning inside of my little guest house I was in, and just passed out and wow. woke up to a candle fire. And it was really scary, you know, smoky. Sure. It was more smoke than anything. It was just smoky and scary and woke up. I was able to put it out. But um, the next day on the bike, I invented this new way to enjoy real flame candlelight uh, by enabling technology in the real flame candlelight fixture and actually creating these things we call, now called candlelight fixtures. Uh, okay. And um, so that led us to you know, when I was on your show last, we had we had molded our way into creating this things called a smart candle. Yep. where we were going to use a smartphone and turn on candles with a smartphone and everything was going IOT and everything's going smart home. And so that seemed to be what I, what I should do. Okay. Um, but it really wasn't the safest way to do it because uh, the problem with that product was that it's, it's a non line of sight ignition of an open flame. So what I mean by that is, you know, when you, when you, yeah, when you light a candle, you have to right now it's been they've been around for 5000 years when you sure. light a candle you take responsibility for like i'm lighting this open flame right? It, right it it could burn my house down if i don't take care of it so but it's it, but there's no product liability to it because you're you're the one lighting the open flame you're right. making the decision that's why it says put it in a safe place keep it out of reach of children and pets all those different things but when we made the smart candle, it sounded like a great idea at the beginning we put tons of money into it we sure. made we actually made it work and we were ready to launch it. That's why I was on your show last night. Like, yeah, we're going to do yeah. this. We're going to launch this. And we're all ready to go. And then we realized that no matter how much technology we put into it, which we were putting a lot of put to sensor technology to make sure uh, it was safe, um, it, the fact is you were, not, you were able to light this product without being in the same room. Right. So Bluetooth, that's the nature of Bluetooth is like it goes through walls, right? Sure. It goes up and down stairs. And 
uh, which is great, except for lighting an open flame. So if you say, hey, you know, Alexa, turn on my candles or use your phone to turn them on. And now you had a candle that was underneath that got accidentally pushed underneath the drapes or your little kid put, made you a drawing and left, left it next to your candle. We put sensors there, but those sensors weren't always working. And so we had to put the brakes on that product. That's why it's been two years pivoting and going out and trying new different things and, and almost going out of business and then wow. coming back out of it. And uh, so it did a lot of twists and turns to try to get to where we are now. Uh, and, um, also the social impact. So the other aspect of, you know, what we always were all about better light, better lives have, has always been our brand story because, um, we wanted to not only create a better candlelight system, but also create better lives. And since we invented the product out in, 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 um, in Africa, we decided to try to create better lives in the continent where that inspiration came from and that innovation came from. So we now donate books for every product sold to, to, to bring, uh, to illuminate the minds of kids less fortunate and bring libraries to underserved communities. Very cool. Um, so that's kind of also evolved from, from that. We were originally going to be giving out, giving out solar lights and we had to pivot out of that because they were way too expensive. And the, the nation that the nations there don't really need solar lights. They need, they need books. They need to be able to get self-sufficient. They need education and literacy. And so, uh, so yeah, we pivoted and changed until we're finally at where we're at now, which is getting ready. You know, we're in mass production and doing a. Uh, we did one production run earlier this month and doing a mass production run at the end of this month of a different, of a di- same product but different. It's not smartphone controlled. It's a remote control. Okay. Uh, real flame candle. It has timers. It still has a lot of safety features with tilt extinguish, and it's really the world's first remote control real flame candle. Um, but you have to point the remote at it and say, I see you, Kendall. I know that you're in a safe place, right? Because it's using yeah, okay. the IR frequency, uh, which is the same as the uh, same as the TV. Gotcha. Uh, it's still very powerful. You can still create a room full of perfect ambiance uh, with the touch of a button, just not using that mechanism for this particular product, gotcha. um, which is much safer, yeah. yeah. No, that makes total sense. I, I totally get that. You're right. Like, it sounds cooler to be able to turn like obviously control fire from a different room but if you burn your house down or you light something on fire obviously that's terrible right so i i totally yep. get why you you guys made the the decision but i want to step back a little bit and walk me through some of that journey so you decided you basically can't or you want to re-engineer the product is that fair to say yeah, I mean, we had taken people's money. We had done okay. a pre-order campaign. So people wanted that product. We had gotcha. hundreds of customers, and they're like, yeah, we want this. And then I had to go back to every one of them and send them an email and say, hey, if you want your money back, let me know, and I'll refund your money. And if you don't and you're willing to let us re-engineer and stay with us as an early adopter customer, you know, let us re-engineer the product with something that's going to be a better product, a safer product. Uh, for you and your family. And I was in 90 92 or so percent of the people stayed sure. because they not only like they, they, they knew it was going to be some kind of wireless magical way to 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 enjoy a better candlelight experience. We were still going to deliver that right? sure. the ability to, to have a way better hassle free, easier, more enjoyable candlelight experience and a safer one. Sure. And so we were going to still deliver that. And so that that was good. And th- we've had custom these people have been with us for over two years and they've wow. been really, really patient. And now they're finally getting their product. And so, so they're, they're, they're all really excited about that. Very cool. So I'm curious though, did you guys have to raise more money or how did you fund this whole thing? <laughs> well, we were pretty much at the, we were pretty much out of money by the time we okay. were at that point. And that okay. was a bad place to be when sure. you know you have to pivot out of a product and so we kind of kept alive just by getting a couple small extra extra uh, investors, me not taking a salary and going into horrific debt, which is very irresponsible as a father of two, now three. Um, and so but I just wasn't willing to die. You know, we just did the passion for the, the Better Light, Better Lives social brand and what we were trying to do. I just knew we'd find a way. So we made a couple different pivots. We were started dancing a little bit with um, with uh, target stores on making a really lower tech version of it okay um, and then and then we went to a kind of a mid tech version of it that was not going to be as expensive and everything every time we get kept getting pulled away from the vision I had of the product which this from a personal level just was gutting me because it all these experts like target saying they wanted and this big billion dollar company out of Europe who said they were willing to pay invest us in in a bunch of the capex and opex expense if we were to do what they wanted to do 
And each time they did that, it was just ripping my heart out. And then finally, some of these deals kind of fell through. Target said, hey, go out and build the, build the product category first and go out and, 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 and build the brand first, then come back. And then finally, we were at this point that uh, we are, there was very little money in the bank. And I said, I ha- I'm just going to do it the way I want to do it, the way that I envisioned doing it when I was on the bike and stop listening to everybody telling me what I should do. And the way I did it at that point, the only thing I could do was go to China and have them do the development because I had no more money to hire a U.S.-based development firms. Interesting. So, so you I, flew I, to China. Yeah, yeah. I, wow. I, I fly pretty cheap because uh, okay. my mom retired from the airlines. So I fly cheap. Uh, so I was able to go to the old vendors I was working with and be like, look, guys, like this is this is the product I want to build. Here's the, here's the requirements. Right? And I gave them a super specific requirements, how I wanted the MCU and the board to be programmed, what I wanted it to do. You okay. know, and if you give any, I mean, if you're smart and you have good people in China, which, and that's not always easy to find, sure. but I found really good people in Hong Kong and China that, that said, you give me the requirements. What do you want it to do? What do you want the remote control to do? What do you want this to do? What do you want the timer to do? And then we went through 18 iterations in wow. the course of almost a year. And it was painstaking, but I found some really good, I found an a electric mechanical engineer on, on Upwork who was willing to work for super reduced rate because he loved what we were doing. We loved our social impact, loved the innovation. And we were able to just go back and forth and just iterate, 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 trying to blend consumer electronics and fire. Okay, right? sure. I mean, people yeah. don't put consumer electronics and fire together, right? Nobody's no. done that. And generally, they try to avoid that, right? Yeah. Um, and we were here, we were <laughs> sure. literally trying to blend it together and, and make it work. And uh, <laughs> so it took a lot. I mean, it took a lot of just passion and dedication and, and, uh, and just hard headedness, you know, and, but also really good partnerships and keeping, you know, keeping it real with them and being really transparent with, uh, you know, supply chain out in, in, um, in, in, in China, a couple parts of China. And so we have three supply chain folks in China and one in, in the U S which is also down in Mexico. And so, you know, the dealing with those relationships was the heart was not hard, but it was just, that was important. It was critical because they all supported, they, they invested not necessarily money, but, resources right sure. testing and and uh putting things in prototyping and then then some reason invoices didn't come for those prototypes you know and it was like well, they're in right they believe in what we're doing they believe that we're going to create the world's first natural lighting platform and so that's really you know kevin if you ask like building the future like creating the future like what are we really doing we're not creating candles sure we're creating natural lighting fixtures right so yeah, the only way that you, the only the only th- choice you have inside your house is artificial light. Yeah. That's the only choice. When you go turn the light switch on is artificial light. And art, there's been over 500 medical research studies just in the past decade. A lot of them led out in Europe, but some here as well. T- linking artificial light at night to a myriad of health issues. Sure. Because the body is getting flooded with this light that's not natural. And it's messing with the melatonin levels, messing with the cardiac rhythms. And people are getting sick. And they're yeah. linking it to real proper, proper disorders, health disorders, because they're just, they, people aren't regular, you know, they take in natural food, they take in natural water, natural ingredients, but they take in tons of artificial light. So, you know, this is the first product is a candle product. We are going back to the smart candle, but we're making fixtures because in the end, what we want to do is, is create a natural lighting option that people can have the choice of natural or, or, or artificial light or a combination of natural and artificial based on the ambience they're trying to create, what time of day it is at nighttime, right before bed, you should be getting as low on, on artificial light and as high on natural light as possible. So enabling those, that, that natural light, which can help people live a better light and better lives, have better light and better lives in their lives, at the same time creating a revolution of of illuminating the minds of kids by, again, creating a residual, continual um, stream of illumination by, by, by donating the books and building libraries and underserved communities. So when you hit a light switch now and you come home, yeah. that light switch for your artificial light does nothing to help anybody. It goes to the power company, everyone sure. makes money, and that's, nobody's making anything. If you hit our light switch, which we do actually have a wall mount that's the shape of a light switch, okay, and you actually mount that next to it, well, every time you hit that, you're illuminating people's minds every single day. And so that's really the bigger vision of, of Better Light, Better Lives is, is, uh, is trying to create a natural lighting system and using that, uh, that, that consumable, that renewable fact that light is, you know, it's something that you have to keep renewing, keep paying for over and over, using that as a vehicle to illuminate minds. 
Very cool. So I, I want to dive a little yeah. bit into the charity side in a bit, but I, I want to dive yeah. a bit deeper into the actual tech and how the candle actually works because I was watching the mm -hmm. videos before we chatted and it's really quite fascinating all the technology that you guys have put into this thing. So do you want to talk about some of the features? Because just watching the video and like a kid walks by and he bumps the table and the thing blows itself out. It was pretty cool, right? And there's a bunch of other things yep. that it does, but that to me was the most fascinating part. So walk us through kind of all the features that are built into this, this candle. Yeah. I mean, because I was in a candle fire, I mean, my, my top priority was trying to get it something as safe as possible to, to reduce fire danger. Right. Sure. And, and what can we do to reduce fire danger? Traditional candles burn down Right. right. They burn from up, you know, gravity does their thing and they burn down. My candle fire was when the candle burned down and started like a table on fire. And that does happen. Right. Um, so our candle never burns down. Right. right? It, it uses refills that keep the flame always at the top. So that's from a safety perspective, that's better. Um, and also from an enjoyment of the flame, it's better. Like traditional pillar candles. Yeah. They burn down into that like tunnel of death where you lose the flame and sure. you have to curse getting your lighter in there to try to light the thing and end up throwing yeah. it away. Or burning your um, hand. <laughs> so, it, yeah, burning your hand, getting in there. So that's it gets rid of that. And also from a decor standpoint of accent decor, it allows people to have a consistent accent decor and actually have a pillar candle accent decor that is actually always beautiful and always nice. Um and so that's, you know, from there, but we put timers in it as well, because if you did forget to extinguish it, it would, it would do that up for it for you as well with the timers. So you have to, when you go and you ignite it, you, cause we, we so we have igniters. So the okay. igniters uh, is an elect electric ignition system. So there's no gas in it. Okay. So if you drop, it's not going to blow up. Right. Sure. It's, it's using Important. electricity. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Oh. Yeah. Very so, important. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And there, and, and, and there's, there, there's nothing flammable there, there. There's nothing flammable in it. Right. The, the, the oil that we use, we use a liquid paraffin, which is the same, has the same flammability as olive oil. Right. So it's not, oh, it's not okay. going to drip out and then catch on fire on the on the carpet. So it's, we've taken all that out of it, but, um, the, uh, we put tilt extinguish because I have pets, I have kids sure. and I have an elderly mother, right? Those are the three kind of target markets, right? You have Got you. elderly folks that are starting to get a little careless they're bumping into things they're forgetting to turn things off. Um, and they can't get out of the chair, right? Yeah, so they can't get up and light and turn off and things like that. Cause they're, they're getting older. And then you have people that have pets and, and kids with balls and tails and stuff wagging. And, and so, you know, we just, put some features in there and mainly using sensors to to extinguish the flame if if it's tilted if it if it tilts and falls like you saw in the video yeah uh, we just use a pretty you know nothing nothing that that's not out in the market we, we just enabled it in 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 our patented solution you know and gotcha. and uh and enabled it into what we've got that looks like a beautiful decorative pillar but just has tech tech enabled inside of it sure and, and people can buy different looking outer kind of pillars right like you have a handful of yeah. styles yeah we have a handful of styles that we're launching with three three kind of more traditional wax and then a couple of glass shells okay. uh, we're launching with a with a, a, a black kind of sleek glass shell and then a white uh kind of a white one so the, for the more modern household got you um we are uh, you know we've got those uh that that we've developed and you know we have a very limited amount of those that we're launching with just to see how the market responds because the, sure. the the minimum order quantity on those is really high so they were able to get us a few just to kind of get out and test the market on those before we really start building a ton of inventory in those got you so yeah okay and then you, you mentioned you have these little canisters that are refillable. How does the whole refilling the candle work and how long does it actually last? If I just let it burn, how many hours do I get? Yeah. So the, so they're, they're, they're not refillable. They're oh. inter interchangeable. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That um, makes so, sense. So yeah. So yeah. So you buy a pack of two, they're called okay. caring candle refills. Got you. So the caring candle refills every, every two pack you, that, that, that you buy is a book out to uh, a library. Right. right cool. So, um, so yeah, so depending how many you have, you could be, you know, contributing to dozens of books every, every month just by enjoying awesome, better candlelight. Very cool. Um, so yeah, they, they, they burn for 20 to 25 hours each and they're okay. about five bucks each. So gotcha. it's very affordable. So once you make the investment in the, in your fixture, right. So we're really creating candlelight fixtures. Okay. Once you make a one-time investment in the fixture, um, then 
the, the use pays itself off. And, and how right? much is the, the fixture? The, actual use. Uh, the, the, uh, the starter set, everyone needs to get at least one starter set because the starter set will get you your remote control. Gotcha. Um, so your remote control and your starter set and a nice gift box is $129. Okay. And then it's $99 for each other candle you want to buy on top of it. Gotcha. So, you know, you know about 100 bucks is what you're looking for as you start building your, your candlelight fixture fixtures out there and then as i said it's only it's only five dollars for 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 uh for about 20 to 25 hours uh per the refill candles and you just pop them in and pop them out and uh and off you go very cool and then you also have the option that could, people can put in uh fragrance rings correct correct yeah yeah we've actually partnered with a very very well known uh, uh fragrance partner who works with yankee candle and bath and body works oh, and uh, and they and they uh, they've given us uh, access to some really amazing patented technology to use in our particular application of this uh, of of a um, patented composite that they've built, which holds a really high fragrance load. So okay. uh, it has a really nice cold throw. Which cold throw means that even if it's not heated, it'll still have a little bit of fragrance. But okay. as soon as you heat it up, it has a pan on the top, which is beautiful, like color, shaped like a sun, which is part of the illumination kind of motif. Gotcha. Um, yeah. And uh, and once that pan heats up, uh, it throws a beautiful fragrance of your choice. So you can choose what you want when you want. And unlike scented candles, you're kind of stuck for 100 hours or uh, 80 hours with one fragrance. This you could buy like all six fragrances or 10 fragrances and and swap them out when you want and put them back in the bag, try a new one or not have any for a little while. And so it just gives you a bit more, a lot more flexibility. Yeah, that's that's actually really interesting. I was going to ask you how you pull that off, but you just mentioned it with heating up the thing because I was like, traditional calendars, you have to burn it to get the fragrance, right? And you're right. After a couple of days, you're like, I don't want to smell this anymore. So yeah, that's cool that you can swap that out and, and change that out. That's No, that's really cool. So when can people actually get a hold of uh, these candles? We, well, we, we we're very fortunate. We sold out of our first batch um, Congrats, within man. about That's 48 huge. hours. Wow. Yeah. So we, 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 we didn't make that many, um, sure. but we made enough to, to, to go out and sell them. And uh, so now we have our second batch is being made. Uh, we start production on November 19th okay. and uh, they'll be shipping them around the 26th via air cargo container in time for Christmas. Very cool. um, the best bet, I mean, depending on where you, when you air this, this podcast, I mean, sure. you know, the way, right now people can pre-order it by the time uh, around the 9th or so of December is our plan to have everything in the warehouse and actually be in full swing e-commerce mode, you know, that people can go and buy batch two, which is a very limited, it's a, it's a really, it's a collector's edition. So it's actually okay. going to be, each one is, each one is numbered. Uh, off the production line to a lid to a limited run so it's really our first major uh, large-scale production run so it's a it's a really neat opportunity to get be part of something that's really the first of what will be a whole line and, and eventually a new revolution of of natural lighting very cool so i, I want to cover something that i i think people would have questions about do i have to plug the candle in or or charge the remote or, or how does that kind of work yeah, it's it's got a rechargeable battery and a okay. USB. Uh, so you just charge the fixture once every two months or so. Okay, very. Depending cool. on your use, and if sure. you're if you're a power user and you're showing it to your friends and doing magic tricks, it's going to probably wear out a little faster. Sure. Um, but uh, no, on average, about about a about two months uh, ah. is what our estimate is. That so we got to kind of get them out in the wild and find out if that's going to hold true. And then you just pull it down, stick it, stick the USB charger in, charge it for a couple hours, and then you're ready to go for a few months. So it doesn't consume a lot of battery, unlike the smart candle was really con power consumer because it was the you know Bluetooth right. was always on and things like that. So it's not quite as power hungry. Sure. Um, and uh, and so yeah, so it's really convenient, and you don't have to buy batteries for it. So um, so yeah. Is the remote the same then? You just charge it every once in a while. No, the remote control uses those little those little coin batteries. Oh yeah, okay. Those, yeah, okay. They last a really long time. It's a pretty yeah, standard it's like remote years control. They last, yeah. yeah, yeah. Depends, yeah. Again, yeah. it all depends. Yeah, on fair enough. Kids, but last quite a while. Very cool. So you've kind of mentioned throughout the show about all your charity work and uh, around everything, but I really want to dive and make sure people are one hundred percent clear about exactly what you guys are doing. So every time they buy a candle you donate a book or how does that kind of work? So um, 
if it goes back a little deeper, like when I was traveling on my bicycle, I met a guy named Innocent who came on the back of my bike, okay. uh, and he shared his he shared a dream to his dream to start a school for AIDS orphans and the needy, right? This huge okay. AIDS orphan problem in, in, in Uganda. And, um, and so I, I ended up helping him as a friend and we ended up still, we had created a school together, which is still going today as 200 cool. students, just a fantastic, um, friendship that's led to a really great, um, a really great, uh, school. So and you so, still talk so to him, passion, it sounds like. Yeah. So yeah in fact, he, cool. in fact, we're, we're, in fact, we're building a library. One of the two libraries is at his school. Oh, very cool. They don't have a full, full, yeah, they don't have a full blown library. So I'm actually going back there in February for very my cool. birthday. Very so cool. He always likes me coming back to my birthday. Sure. And, uh, okay, keep and going. So, yeah, Sorry. we're going to build a library out there. And that's good. And um, so we partnered with a company, not us doing it. It's actually a nonprofit, 40 year old nonprofit called Books for Africa. Very cool. They're the largest exporter of donated and used and um, basically out of print books. So basically, like if a if a textbook goes from revision six to revision seven, um, uh, that publisher will donate those books instead of throwing them away. They'll donate and they get the tax write off or whatever, and then they they keep all these books in Atlanta, Georgia. Volunteers catalog, uh, catalog the books. Wow. And then communities and schools and churches and, and basically anybody who needs books out in the community can can pick from the catalog and then donors, which is like us, will go and sponsor a, an entire container to be sent out to various ports of, and then transported to these communities to bring libraries. And these libraries change lives. I mean, sure. kids um, who never had the opportunity to go to have a place to go and read and explore and learn their passions now have a place after school to go and really learn and dive in. People learn to become farmers and learn to become students. I mean, it's, sure. it's phenomenal uh, what it does to lives. And, uh, and so, you know, that's the, again, that's where the inspiration came from. So we're going to start there, but we're eventually going to move into to, to programs in the United States and down in Latin America and Asia. And that's the vision is to, is to just continue to find communities that, that can benefit from, from having that gift of literacy. No, I think that's really great. I, I, I love that. And I, I think the thing is to, that that people forget the internet is basically one big library of content sure you pull it up on your phone or your your tablet or your computer a lot there's still a lot of people in the world that don't have access to the internet right even on a, a mm -hmm. phone so i think it's great that you guys are doing that and sure like a outdated textbook that's a year or two old isn't really that how much content is really irrelevant it's just they can't sell it or whatever so i think that's really great man yeah, no, it's 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 powerful. It, it it definitely changes lives and makes a makes a measurable impact in communities. And that's sure that's kind of what I wanted to do as an innovator. And I didn't want to just make money. I mean, I, anybody can just make money. I just felt like it was, and that's kind of the next generation of of, of leaders. I think and, and entrepreneurs in the next generation. I think they're believing that you can do both. You can make money and make impact and make it. And, and that's our responsibility to do so as a global community. So that's, I'm kind of part of this next, uh, I guess, vision. No, I 100% agree. I, I think that's great, man. So I, I'm curious though, you've been through some really good, big kind of highs and, and some lows just kind of on your journey throughout creating Ludella. Do you want to walk us through some of the things you've kind of learned along the way or advice or how did you get yourself through you know, some of the hard, really hard times, because I think it's so easy to give up, but you didn't like you created this thing and you recreated this thing and you know, you're, you're doing well now. So like, how did you pull yourself out of that? Um, I mean, most, most entrepreneurs will tell you that, you know, this, the success of an entrepreneur is just not quitting. Sure. Uh, and you just need to just keep going, keep pivoting, keep moving, keep pivoting. At some point you'll know when it's time to give up, you know, if there's truly, truly, it's just not working, but we never got, we never got signs that our idea wasn't valid. People uh, validated the idea right. all over. And so we are getting validation from people from, from QVC, from Brookstone, from, from folks all over and different channels. So we, we knew we just had, we just had to figure out getting through the long development cycle. Right. Uh, and that's in hardware, that's hard. I mean, yeah. and so a lot of companies fail because they just can't find a way to skin that right. and they just go crazy. And I mean, I've got wife and kids and I don't, I'm not proud of the, the amount of time, the moments that I've missed in their life. Uh, I've done my best to try to be as balanced as I could. Um, sure. But, uh, you know, you do have to make sacrifices and folks will tell you you have to make some sacrifices. So 
um, we signed up for that and we're trying to trying to pull out of that a little bit now and, and, uh, be a little bit less, um, a little bit less 18 hour day focused right now and a little bit more balanced, but still a lot of long days. Sure. But the biggest thing I learned, Kevin is, you know, if I can go back into it sure. again, it's just like, you gotta, you gotta trust your gut and yeah. trust who your, I trust your idea. Cause there's always experts out there. <laughs> yeah. My biggest mistake I made, it was I trusted way too, I had way too many advisors. I listened uh, to everybody's advice. And I kept changing ideas based on who I talked to and like, you should do this. Oh no, 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 don't do that. Build this. And oh, don't. Yeah. And then next thing you know, you, and you, and if you don't believe in yourself and have your own vision of what you're trying to create and share with the world, that's how people spin their wheels. And I spun my wheels way too long. I could have already been at market a long time ago if I would have just, you know, got to the point of what I was really trying to do um, and not listen to so many others and get too many chefs in the kitchen. And so, um, People don't have faith in their own ability. They think they didn't go to school enough. They, you know, I, I, I just got off a bike. What right do I have to be able to create hardware and consumer electronics and, and things like that? Maybe I, maybe he's smarter than me. And I listen to all these other people. Sure. Um, and so I think you know that's the biggest thing is like if you have a, a burning desire to create something and innovate and share something that you've come up with in the world, you just got to believe deep inside and and uh, and get out there and build it. Yeah, in, in a lot of cases, at least in my experience, you can tell me your thoughts on this. Sometimes it's not even worth telling people that aren't entrepreneurs what you're doing, unless it's kind of your your f maybe immediate friends and family, because I find people are like, you shouldn't do that. You should do this. And it's like, you know, we're 10 minutes into a conversation. You have no idea what I'm really doing. And I'm not trying to be negative. It's just that conversation can send you in the wrong direction so quick because it kind of gets in your head, right? So I, mm -hmm. I, I, I totally get that. Yeah, it's, it's, I think that's actually really good advice to people because I, I think it's so easy to get kind of lost and trapped and you don't know how you're going to uh, actually pull yourself out. And I've heard a lot of people that have been really successful talk about they still have no idea what they're doing some days and they still feel like they're still figuring it out. But, but I think that's kind of important to mention that that feeling to a lot of people never goes away. Like if you make millions of dollars, there are a lot of people that still feel like they have no idea what they're doing and they're still figuring stuff out because it's just a different set of problems that they're trying to solve. Sure. They have more money to throw at the problem, but sometimes that creates more problems. So there, yeah. you know what I'm getting at? Yeah, no, and that, that's a, that's a, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, people look at me and say, "Oh, you've got it. You're doing so great." And I'm like, "No, I'm not doing great. I'm I'm lo I'm scared shitless." Yeah, Excuse fair my language, I guess, I'm on that end. But I mean, I mean, I'll, I'm scared. I wake up at three o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat. I mean, I don't know if that's success. I mean, yeah. it's scary. Sometimes it's scary. You don't. I don't know if I'm making the right decisions. I have to make decisions on the fly all day. So and that's what you have to do. You don't have time to evaluate every decision. Sometimes you're like, "Yeah, I just do that." That, okay, we're doing that, and that's it. And you got to do that; otherwise, you'll you'll wallow around. So you got to trust your gut in those decisions. But those are scary because you've got other people's money on the line. You got your family's future on the line, and a couple a couple wrong decisions can can take things the wrong direction. So, um, yeah, it, I don't know if it's ever going to get easier, but it, it would be nicer if I can get some more <laughs> some more people on my team and some people that I don't, that I've, I've been wearing a lot of caps. So I'm finally sure. delegating, bring, able to bring a few people on to, to kind of help, uh, help balance things out a little bit, but. Interesting. Actually, that, that actually is really good transition to my next question. I was going to ask you, obviously you're doing a bunch of things and some you're probably, you would probably openly admit you're better at than others. Some of those things you probably enjoy a lot more than others. How did you learn to do some of the stuff that you you didn't think you were very good at and overcome that side of your growth before you could hire somebody to delegate that stuff? Uh, you just, because you have no choice, right? Yeah, it's okay. A, you're forced, you're forced to figure it out. So you've got to kind of get in there and figure it out. And, and um, 
you know, the, the, the innovation side and the business development side, all that stuff I love. Uh, okay. I don't really like the office, the office stuff and the day-to-day grind stuff. And, okay. and I don't really like managing employees either. And I, don't say I'm a, I wouldn't say, you know, being a, being a, a boss or, or a leader of other people is necessarily my strength. Okay. Um, uh, so I've got to find people eventually who are better than me and than that uh, at some point in my, in the growth of the company uh, to, you know, the way of organizational design and, roles and responsibilities and human resource design and all that things like that. It's kind of where, where I'm in now in growing the company. And that's, that's, it doesn't come naturally to me. Uh, so I having to learn and dive in and, and, uh, and, and, and do my best here. Yeah, no, that's interesting because I, I, I think that's, I think some of the hardest things to get over is your fear of doing something you don't enjoy because you have to, right? Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So uh, you kind of mentioned it a little bit early on that you want to create more than just candles and and you want to bring kind of natural light into the home. How soon do you think you will get there? Is it years out? Is it months out? Or, or do you not really know? Well, you know, I, I, I would like to believe that the hardest work is behind us in the sense okay. that we have figured out finally okay. how to blend consumer electronics and fire successfully, right? And to right. create a, a, a light switch for light, for us. We've created a light switch for real flame candlelight, right? Gotcha. And for that natural flame lighting to be able to turn it on. So we also, right now, we have an Alexa-enabled prototype, okay. right? Alexa-enabled. Alexa, please turn on my candles. And then the whole run, the room lights up and people go, oh my God, I want that, right? You sure? It's not ready yet. But that that is in development right now. We have okay. engineers working on it. We have stuff going on. So that's a 2019 launch. You'll see. Cool. And those are the two fixtures I want. Right. The fixture that's coming out now is really uh, kind of standard decorative pillar candles that look like an, an scented home market, and uh, you can change the colors, accent your decor, accent lighting, scented home. And then the next is really is the IoT space. It's okay. the, it's the, the folks who want to be able to tell Alexa to do things. And they want to be able to um, have an indoor outdoor fixtures that could be wall mounted, surface mounted, torch mounted, indoor outdoor. Right. But they're in, they're inside lanterns, yeah. so they're not open flame. And so we so that's how we're getting over that. So we're building our own style of lanterns, and then people can choose from different lantern styles. But they're always will be enclosed uh, because it is non line of sight ignition. So we got to make sure if it's if you can't see it, if something fell on it, it's still going to be safe because. Uh, it's inside of a lantern. So that's coming out in 2019. Very cool. So, and then I'm going to take that on the shark tank in, you know, in, in fall of, of 2019 and then really explode the, the brand and the vision and, and everything in 2019 when we have two devices, uh, really one for that, those two distinct markets, sure. but in that same kind of technology enabled real flame candlelight, uh, sector that in product category that we're really building and spearheading. Interesting. So you've obviously spent a bunch of time manufacturing overseas. What advice do you give people that are looking to do something in the hardware space? Because it's extremely challenging. And you went through 18 versions in a year, you mentioned earlier. So do you have any yeah. advice for people that are looking to kind of manufacture overseas or, or even anywhere, uh, really? Yeah, I mean, I don't know about anywhere besides Asia right now. Well, China, Me- Mexico has a lot of the same things. It always is going to boil down to relationships in Asia, okay. especially. Um, so making trips out there, I wouldn't say go blind. Some people just get on a plane and go blind, and that oftentimes doesn't work well. Okay. Um, so networking, networking first, finding okay. people who ha- are successful and already have relationships with people in the particular hardware space and already have a manufacturing partner. Uh, already have people on the ground there that can help them. Okay. Uh, that's a great warm, get those warm intros. And then, but then you've got to be prepared to go out there and visit them. And I think the biggest advice is be prepared to travel and be prepared for yourself to get re- really granularly specific on your requirements of what you're trying to build before you don't, don't, don't go there. If you get wishy-washy, you're going to get wishy-washy results, right? Uh, okay. Figure out what it is you want to build. What do you want it to do? What do you want it to look like? Uh, how do you want it to do it? If this happens, then that happens. If this doesn't happen, then this should happen. Like all that logic for what you want, whatever kind of boards, whatever thing you want to build, if it's consumer electronics, if it's, you know, if it's design related, 
at least get you know some decent sketches done okay uh here you don't have to go that far because they have they have a lot of that in china i mean again this is if i could go over and do it again i would probably go that approach because there are good designers there's in industrial design they're probably not the best i mean i think there's people will say industrial design should probably try to get a lot of that done you know by someone that is going to take your vision of what you want to look like uh, right um okay. but there is a lot of that even even available now over there so the key is just to be really specific how you want it to work and be willing to travel over there with good good references and, and do your homework before you do sure so how long should somebody go the first time week two weeks a month how what did you find works the best yeah i mean a month a month is pretty long i mean okay. I, I i i personally have kid family and stuff so i'm not going to go out a month uh sure. but i think if you plan your time right and plan the meetings right a week a week to 10 days is, it shouldn't mean more than a week to 10 days to have some meetings okay. visit some factories um go out through some things um and uh and you know if you can even get a quick trip out first just to make the first meeting and then set them off on building the first prototype and then come back for the prototype build. Uh, okay. So they know that they're building something and then they know that they're supposed to deliver something to you. And then you could walk out with them and then start testing those prototypes with them and give them some testing things for their team to do and your team to do. And then, then create a team environment that it's both of your projects. So um, going forth on that front there. So, and there's, I mean, the, the IP side of all that stuff, I mean, I mean, we, we got a patent in the U S uh, okay. we have a patent being done in China. And so there's a bunch of stories that, that that could be like a whole nother show. And I'm not an expert at that. So, um, but uh, if you're with good people and you re- build those relationships, you know, technically they're not going to be throwing your stuff on Alibaba right. right when you go into production, right? Because, because you built a good relationship and you're in the partnership together. But I, I got a China patent because I wanted to protect my manufacturer from me and my manufacturer from people that are dicey out there and trying to do being dishonest. So, um, so it, it, that shows, I think, good respect to your, to your Chinese um, manufacturing partners when you go the extra expense to get that, that China patent done on your end. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's quite fascinating. How did you find, was there a big language barrier or uh, miscommunications because of language? No, I, uh, I, 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 most, my contacts are in Hong Kong. So okay. they're Hong Kong based owners of the factories that are just across the, the border and, uh, Dongguan and Shenzhen and, you know, that whole Guangdong area and south right. of China. Uh, generally you're going to find folks that speak English pretty well. Okay. No, I just, that's one thing that I've heard from people they are like, well, I can't go there cause they don't know the language. It's like, well, I'm sure you could probably find yeah. somebody English speaking or at least good enough right that you can get by mm-hmm. but, but yeah it's definitely a concern yeah. so i'm i'm curious we're we're kind of coming to the end of the show so for for people that maybe tuned in a bit late do you want to just give a quick overview of what exactly ludella is and then where people can actually check the website out to to order one and uh mm-hmm. get it in time for christmas sure Again, uh, you know, this is a, is a product that was, uh, you know, I was in a, I was in a candle fire uh, while I was out traveling in Africa, and that inspired this innovation of let's create a better, a better real flame candle. There's been no innovation in five thousand years in the real flame candle space. Wow. Uh, except this, the LED candles, which is not a real, it's not a real flame, but sure. it became a, you know, multi a billion dollar industry because it solved a lot of the problems with with meth and candle fire risk, fire risk, and so forth. So. Uh, so that's where that innovation came from. And then we decided to turn it into a B Corp and become a social impact brand that, that's dedicated to better light, better lives for customers and the global community by donating books for every product sold to bring libraries to underserved communities and illuminate the minds of kids uh, that, uh, that are a little bit less fortunate. Um, and so, uh, so really, it's really amazing technology enabled candlelight fixtures that can be used to decorate and enjoy real flame candlelight and, and, and also scented home experiences with the touch of a button with a lot of safety features that they can uh, have a safer, more enjoyable, more convenient real flame candlelight experience and creating really the vision, as I said, of, of natural lighting, right? So going, creating a natural lighting revolution where you can enjoy instead of just flick, clicking on a switch of, of fake artificial light, you're creating real natural lighting uh, that's more relaxing, romantic, uh, meditative and helps you sleep better and, and live a happier and healthier life. 
So that's the vision of the product. And so uh, Ludella.com, L-U-D-E-L-A, Ludella.com is uh, our website. We've got an e-commerce uh, site that we actually just launched right now a couple days ago, actually. So we're taking a couple pre-orders um, because we sold out of our batch one. And so we have batch twos uh, being made now. We'll be available early, uh, early December and be arriving on people's door before Christmas. Very cool, man. So I again, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you, and have a good rest of your day, man. All right. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.